If you're trying to find it, it's after Obadiah. Page 928 uh, of the Church Bibles. As we continue, uh, as we begin rather, this uh, four-week sermon series uh, looking at the book of Jonah. Um, the book of Jonah, the story of Jonah, is perhaps uh, one of the most famous stories in the whole Bible. Uh, perhaps one of the most well-known. You can probably think of children's books. I've seen children's books here in this building with uh, a lovely cute whale swallow, swallowing Jonah. It's a very sort of vivid picture, isn't it? In fact, you can see a picture of the whale uh, on there. What's it all about, though? What is the book of Jonah really all about? Did Jonah really spend three days in the belly of a whale? And what relevance does that have to life in 2023? You see, here's the thing about Jonah. It's not all about the whale. It's not all about the whale. In fact, it probably wasn't a whale. The Bible doesn't say he was swallowed by a whale, but a big fish. It must have been a pretty big fish to swallow him up, but it wasn't a whale. In fact, the, the fish or the whale is not the main point of the book. It's perhaps the most vivid part, perhaps the most famous bit, but it's not the main thing of the book. The book is not all about the big fish, but the God, the big God who is at work in the world, and at work in the world even despite a reluctant prophet, even despite a prophet who does the opposite of what God has asked him to do. You see, Jonah the man, the prophet, is a very unusual sort of prophet, very unlikely sort of prophet. He's the opposite of what you might expect a prophet to be like. He's an anti-hero in that sense, uh, he's the opposite of what we should look to be like as people. He hears what God says, and then what does he do? He does the opposite of what God has asked him to do. He runs in the other direction. He's a reluctant prophet, very unusual in the Old Testament. He's the opposite of what we should be like. And yet, if we're being honest, I suspect as we go through the book of Jonah, that some of what we see in Jonah's heart, in his attitude, might actually be something of what is reflected in our heart and our attitude. It might not be quite as stark as it is with Jonah getting on a ship and heading in the opposite direction, but if we reflect, there may be something of our thoughts, our attitudes that we see in Jonah's attitudes. Now, as we look at chapter uh, one uh, this morning, we're going to see a number of different characters, but in chapter one, only two people, only two characters have names. Only two people are named Jonah and the Lord, God, Yahweh, the, the, the covenant-keeping God. And that's because the book, and particularly chapter 1, is revolving around Jonah and his relationship with God, who God is and how he relates to him. And so uh, this morning, as we look at chapter 1, we'll see three truths about God, three truths. The first is, you can't hide from God. You can't hide from God. Look at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, in many ways, this is a pretty standard opening to the prophets. The word of the Lord comes to the prophet. That's pretty standard in the Old Testament, comes lots of times. The prophet hears the word of God. And the role of the prophet was to be the sort of spokesperson on behalf of God, to hear the message that God was giving, and to be the authoritative uh, spokesperson for that message, to declare that message. We might think prophets sort of predicted the future. They do some of that. Most of what the prophets do is actually calling God's people, calling Israel back into covenant faithfulness, calling them back to worship the Lord. That's mainly what the role of the prophet was. They were to hear God's message, to declare the message to God's people, Israel, and to call them back uh, to obedience. The priests in the temple did most of the teaching. They were to do the teaching. That was one of their roles, was to teach. The prophets were more itinerant. They were going around uh, calling people back uh, to the Lord. Jonah was one of them. The thing about the prophets were they weren't to make up the message. Uh, they, they didn't have sort of artistic license to decide what they wanted to say. It wasn't that they would think, well, you know, Isaiah's been talking a lot about this, and Jeremiah's been banging on about this. I'd like to decide to talk about this. No, their job wasn't to have that sort of creativity. 
It was to hear the word of the Lord and to declare the word of the Lord. They weren't to let their creative juices flow. Um, they were meant to be a bit like postmen. You know, you don't want your postie to decide what letters to deliver. You don't want them to think, well, you know, they've had lots of nice handwritten letters this week. Perhaps I should give them a kebab flyer or a flyer from the estate agents telling them to sell their house. You don't want them to think like that. What you want the postman to do is to get the letters that they're meant to deliver and to deliver them. That's the job. There's no creativity in it. You're to deliver the post that you're meant to deliver. Well, the prophets were meant to be like that, to hear what God is saying and to deliver it to the people. That's Jonah's job. What does specifically God say to him? Verse 2, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. The job that Jonah has to do is to go to Nineveh and to call them out on their sin. Now, Nineveh was a major city, not in Israel, but in Assyria, the regional superpower, the enemy of God's people, Israel. He's to go to one of their cities and to tell them that they're sinning, to tell them that they're being wicked. This was a regional superpower who, perhaps in a hundred or so years' time, would come and destroy ten of the twelve tribes of Israel. These were the enemies of God's people. And the Assyrians were known for their brutality. They would flay the skin off their opponents and put it on poles or display it on walls. They would cut the lips and the hands off political dissidents. So it was not a friendly place to go. Jonah's called to go there and to say, to call them out on their wickedness. That's his job. This is a very, very hard job to do. It's also a very surprising job because the vast majority of the time, the prophets were to call Israel back to faithfulness. The prophets were to go out in Israel to God's people and to call them to faithfulness, to call them out on their wickedness. They often weren't called to go to the surrounding nations. Let me ask you a question. How many stories in the Old Testament, I want you to think now, I'm not going to ask you for answers. How many stories in the Old Testament can you think of that have boats or fish in them? Jonah, that's one. How many stories in the Old Testament with boats or fish? Noah's Ark, that's got an ark. Not many, though. You probably can't think of many others that have boats or fish. Some of you are thinking, what is he talking about? Bear with me. How many stories in the New Testament can you think of that have boats or fish in them? <coughs> Loads, is the answer. Loads in the New Testament. Jesus is often on a boat. He's preaching from a boat. He's telling parables about fish. The disciples were fishermen. The disciples then go out on boats to do missionary work. Why am I telling you this? Because in the Old Testament, the focus is not on boats and the sea, but on the land, the physical land that God had given them, on physical land, on physical people. The New Testament is much more going out to the nations, traveling on boats, taking the message of God out to different nations. But in the Old Testament, it's much more focused on a particular land, a particular people. What Jonah is doing is rare. It's unusual in the Old Testament. In some sense, it's a foretaste of the New Testament. It's a foretaste when God's people are called to take the message out to the rest of the world. But it reminds us, even in the Old Testament, God's eyes are not just on one particular piece of land, not just on one particular group of people, but on all people. It reminds us you can't hide from God. The nations are always in his sight, always in his view, always accountable. God knows all things, all people, in all countries at all times. Whether that's you're an Old Testament Israelite, whether that's you're a Ninevite or a 21st century Swindonian, whoever you are, wherever you live, God knows God knows what's happening, even the things happening in secret. There's no way that we can ever think, well, 
God doesn't really know what's going on in my life. He's not that bothered what's going on in my life, what I'm doing. And you think of all that's happening in the world. Is God really bothered about the things that I get up to? My mistakes, my shortcomings? Well, this passage says, no, God sees everything. He sees even the Ninevites, even the people in that country. God sees all. Your way is never hidden from him. Every country, every person, in every place. Everybody is accountable to God. That's good news. Because it means around the world, dictators will be held accountable before God. It means that every criminal who escapes justice in this life will not escape justice in the end. Because everyone is accountable to God. That is very good news, particularly if you are the victim of abuse, if you are the victim of crime. It's good news that everybody is accountable. But it's also very bad news that everybody is accountable because it means that everybody is accountable. Every single one of us. When we have not loved God as we ought to, or when we haven't loved the people around us, our neighbor, as we ought to. When we break God's moral law, even in our heart attitudes, Jonah 1 reminds us, no matter who we are, no matter where we live, God sees. He holds people accountable. It's a sober reminder this morning. You can't hide from God. That's the first truth. The second truth is you can't run from God, although Jonah tries. Let's have a look. Verse 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Uh, Jonah hears the commission and he does a runner. Tarshish is probably in Spain. So instead of going up to Assyria, he heads in the complete opposite direction, west, to Spain, basically as far away as you could possibly imagine to be. He heads in the complete opposite direction of what God has told him to be, to go. That is the opposite of what you might expect a prophet to do. You would expect a prophet to hear God's word and to act upon it, to be obedient. Jonah does the opposite. He tries to run from God. Now, prophets don't normally behave like that. Jonah doesn't normally behave like that. You can read about Jonah in 2 Kings. Uh, He was a faithful prophet in 2 Kings. God gave him a message, a message that God would bless Israel, that he would bless them by enlarging their borders. That was the message that Jonah had at first. He faithfully heard that message and he proclaimed that message, that message of good news. Maybe that's why he legs it this time. Because previously he's proclaimed good news to Israel and now he knows he's got to go to Israel's enemy and maybe they're going to get good news. Maybe God is going to be gracious to them and that's not going to be good for us in Israel. Maybe that's why he did a runner. But whatever it was, he tries to run from the Lord. How does it work out for him? Verse 4, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. God sends a storm to make the point to Jonah. The ship is about to be broken up. It's about to sink. The sailors are terrified and they call out to their gods. Even verse 6 says, waking up Jonah from his nap. They try and work out what's happening. They realize this is something from the gods. This is a divine action that's happening. They cast lots to determine who must be responsible. They know somebody must be responsible for this. This is a supernatural event. Who's responsible? Well, of course, it falls on Jonah. And Jonah then confesses, verse 9. They say, who are you? I'm a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them. And they asked, what have you done? They knew that he was running away from the Lord because he'd already told them so. Um, Jonah is, of course, correct in verse 9. What he says is true. He is a Hebrew, 
he worships the Lord. He is correct theologically in what he says about God who made the heavens and the dry land. God makes the world. He gives information which is true. It's factually true information that the prophet is giving. But that information doesn't really seem to have changed Jonah very much. He knows what is right about God, and yet what is right about God it doesn't <coughs> seem to have affected him. It doesn't seem to have rubbed off on him or changed him anyway. You know, they say that relationships change people, don't they? If you've been married to uh, somebody for any length of time, you know that that's true. Becca now refers to Man United as we. I have now learned the names of one or two flowers growing in the garden. Relationships change people. It's true in friendships as well. People rub off on you. You become like your friends. That's the way relationships are meant to happen. Well, that was meant to be supremely the case in our relationship with God. We are to be like God, to become more like him. Jonah, though, is not like God in many ways. Now, Jonah knows the truth. When he's trying to flee from the Lord, he knows Psalm 139. There's nowhere I can go to flee from your presence. Jonah knows that. He knows you can't go anywhere in the universe where God is not. And yet there's a difference, isn't there, between knowing and knowing. Between sort of knowing stuff and knowing stuff. Really knowing it. And Jonah seems to sort of know stuff and yet not really know no stuff. In this chapter, even the pagan sailors are more sensitive to God than he is. Because they know in a crisis, they know to pray. They're praying. What's Jonah doing in the crisis? He's asleep. It's also very foolish of Jonah, because the book of Jonah shows us that God is completely in control, completely sovereign over everything that happens in the universe. From appointing a storm to appointing a fish to swallow him up, in commanding the fish to vomit him up onto the shore, in chapter 4 to commanding the wind and the plant and the worm and the mass conversion of Nineveh. That's a spoiler there. God is in control of all of those things, in control of the nations. That's why in view in Jonah is not just one part of the world, but the, the nations and it's foolish to think you can outrun a God like that. A God who is everywhere. The theological word is he, he is immense. He fills all in all. He's everywhere. No one can escape from his presence. And yet, if we're honest, don't we try sometimes? Don't we see that in our own lives? It may be that you're here this morning and you've been coming along to church for a while. And you've heard lots of stuff about Jesus. You know what has been said about him, the gospel. You know that he's come to die. You know that you're to turn to him and to have faith in him and to trust in him. And yet, in your heart, you're still headed in the opposite direction. You're still running away from him. You're still ignoring him. You know the truth of what you've heard, and yet you're heading in the opposite direction. You haven't turned back to him. You're carrying on in the same way that you've been going. You're trying, in some sense, metaphorically, to run away from him. And this passage reminds us, you can't do that. You can't run from his presence. There's nowhere that you can go to be away from him. Stop running. Turn back to him. But it may be that you're here and... You're a Christian. You've been a Christian for a long, long time. And yet, in some sense, you're still doing that same thing. You're running away from the Lord and his word. It may be that you've been reading something in his word that is telling you to do something. And actually, you've been doing the exact opposite. In your heart attitude, you've been running away from the Lord, ignoring his word, not responding to it, not obeying it, but doing the opposite. Or it may be that you've sort of felt led and prompted to do something, to step out in faith in some way, and yet you haven't done that. You've been ignoring God's call, God's, God's desire. You've been ignoring him, perhaps because you're afraid, like Jonah might have been. You're headed in the opposite direction. And maybe this is a reminder this morning. You can't outrun him. You can't get away from him. He's everywhere. Stop running. Come back to him.
Because it leads us to our, our third truth about God. You can be friends with God. You can be friends with God. You see, the chapter ends with a real surprise. Because the chapter ends with God's prophet slowly sinking to the bottom of the ocean, slowly drifting down, thrown overboard, about to die. Well, he, doesn't, he doesn't die. See you next week. Got to come back and see what happens. He doesn't die, but the chapter ends, our passage ends with him floating down, and it ends, in contrast to that, these sailors, these polytheistic sailors who have no background worshipping the one true God, they come to trust in the Lord. They come to salvation. They come to know him and to worship him. They become right with God. They become friends with God, while Jonah, who didn't want the non-Israelites to be saved, is floating down to the bottom of the ocean. There's some irony in that. The people that Jonah didn't want to be saved have actually become saved. This is a reversal of fortunes. How did it happen? How did they become saved? Well, verse 12 says, Jonah is speaking, pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied. It will become calm. I know that this is my fault. And this great storm uh, has come upon you. Uh, everyone knows what's happened. The storm has come because of Jonah. Jonah says, throw me into the sea. Get rid of me. Now, initially, they're hesitant to do that. They know that murder is wrong. They know that they shouldn't do that. But it becomes clear that that really is what they have to do. Verse 15. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard. And the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows uh, to him. They fear the Lord, it says, verse 16. They come <coughs> into relationship with him. They come to know who he is. They come to experience his awesome majesty, his power, his authority, his glory. They, they come into relationship with him. They're saved. They're made right with him now. The storm has passed. And it happened because Jonah was thrown into the sea. It happened because Jonah was thrown overboard. Salvation only came in this chapter because someone had to plunge down into the depths before he rises again. Jonah has to perish in their place if they are to be saved. And we can only be friends with God. We can only be right with God if Jesus perishes in our place for us. Jesus has come into this world to go overboard, as it were, to give himself for us <coughs> so that we can receive salvation, so that we can be saved, so that the storm of God's anger at our sin can be calmed. Jonah was a reluctant prophet. He reluctantly went into the sea. He didn't do what God called him to. But Jesus willingly does. Jesus willingly heard his father's command, his call. He came into this world and he willingly gave himself for us. When Jonah was disobedient, Jesus was obedient. Jesus went to a hard place with a message from God, willingly, with a message that our wickedness had come up before God. And he willingly gave himself in our place so that we could be saved. He's given himself on the cross. He's poured himself out so that we can be friends with God. We can't run from God. We can't hide from him. And yet, because of what Christ has done, we can be friends with God. We can come to know him and be loved by him because Christ has given himself for us. And it may be this morning that you're a bit like the sailors. You've got no church background whatsoever. Perhaps you've been uh, looking for hope and satisfaction and meaning in all sorts of things, in all sorts of gods. Your life might seem like it's far away from God, and yet these sailors came to know and to trust 
the one true God. They came to be saved, and you can too. All of your wrongdoing, even though it has come up before God, can be forgiven because Jesus has come and given his life in your place. He's done everything. All you need to do is to stop running and to turn to him. Let's uh, pray and then we'll sing. Father, we thank you that you know all. You know what is in our hearts. And yet you love us. You've given your son, Jesus. Thank you that he has died in our place. And thank you that we can come to know you this morning, to be known by you, all because of what Christ has done. We pray for those here this morning who perhaps in their hearts are running away from you, perhaps doing the opposite of what they know you have called them to do. We particularly pray for those who as yet have not put their trust in Jesus, have not come uh, into relationship with you. We pray that now you'd be working in their hearts. Help them to return back to you. We pray that they would know that you are a God who is kind and merciful and loving and caring, who always receives us back, no matter how long we've been running. We thank you that our hope truly is in Jesus. Amen.